against the emission. And uh, there are different ways and means, so there are different views, different, and I think uh, the any view which we take has to have a equity into a major focus. And, uh, when I say equity in the sense that what historically has been used by the developing developed world and the developing world, if they have to develop how much they have to use the energy in coming years, so what that should be. So there are very ifs and buts and uh, different assumptions by the different modelers. And I must uh, compliment both uh, Professor Jaraman and Tejal for coming out with an extremely scientific way of judging issue that what we should be the our role. Uh, I don't want to be too much, but I would invite Vijay Sharma to have her opening remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Naik, and it's my pleasure to co-chair this webinar with you today. Uh, I have uh, you know, a couple of very brief remarks in the beginning, and I'm sure that we are all waiting to see the uh, presentation by uh, Drs. Jairaman and Dr. Kanitkar. So I just want to say that, of course, India is a party to the IPCC. Our scientists have engaged very extensively in its assessment reports, including the three reports of the Working Group 3 uh, in the AR6 cycle. And we have welcomed, we as in India, have welcomed the report of the IPCC and very much recognize its contributions. The IPCC itself, as we know, does not conduct any primary research, but undertakes an assessment of the peer-reviewed high quality research to draw inferences about the state of the global climate. Now the IPCC's global mitigation pathways, whether for a 1.5 or a two degrees temperature rise, are based on climate models. And it is important for us to examine the paradigms and the assumptions underlying these models, whose outcomes inform policy making, even though the IPCC as a body itself is policy neutral. We do live in an unequal world today. There are stark differences in incomes, in energy use, uh, in uh, emissions, and in consumption between the developed and the developing. Right. So, uh, I countries in the global south act still do have a substantial development agenda ahead to enhance their incomes and the quality of life of the citizens. We expect that these development deficits would be overcome very rapidly as the developing countries accelerate their growth trajectories. Now, the work of Dr. Jairaman and Dr. Kanetkar demonstrates that most of the models that assessed in the IPCC report project the inequalities of today well into the future. And these models assume that incomes, energy use, and consumption in the global south shall remain well below that of the developed world in 2050 and beyond. I'm sure in the presentation we will see all the details. Uh, I'll be happy to come in later uh, at the end of the presentation and we, then after we've heard the questions as well. But I do look forward to your presentation in which you have expanded your analysis from what you had presented the last time around at COP27. Over to you. Thank you. remarks and uh, I will now request uh, Tejal to give her presentation. Over to you, Tejal. Thank you very much, Professor Naik, and let's just share the webinar. Full screen. Full screen. Sorry. So uh, I hope the presentation is uh, visible. So let me since we have uh, uh, not much time, let me dive right into it. We have looked at uh, uh, the scenarios assessed in the IPCC's sixth assessment report. Uh, at the outset, I think it is important to uh, underline that the sixth assessment report relies heavily 
on these global model scenarios. These scenarios come from integrated assessment models. And a large proportion of these scenarios are derived from what is called the shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, this is a framework for constructing scenarios that was developed uh, some years into the cycle, I mean, the beginning of the cycle, six, cycle of the sixth assessment report. Uh, amongst other questions, the I think an important question that this framework tries to pose and then eventually answer through these model scenarios is what kind of a world, uh, you know, what are the social and economic assumptions uh, that uh, are that are underlying a world that we would project uh, for the future, which is compatible with a 1.5 or a 2 degree Celsius uh, 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 world in the future for 2050 and even beyond going up to 2100. However, uh, the IPCC report itself, especially the uh, report of the third working group that focuses on mitigation, makes it clear that the mitigation pathways do not explore issues around income distribution or environmental justice, but assume implicitly that where and how action occurs can be separated from who pays for that action. This is a, a statement directly from chapter one of working group three. It also says uh, that emissions vary between the assumptions and alternative assumptions may result in similar emissions and climate responses. So uh, you might have, for example, uh, seen uh, in the IPCC outreach or other uh, uh, media, um, you know, see uh, results certain aspects of what uh, needs to be done in fossil fuels or the transport sector or the uh, industrial sector or other sectors. Uh, the IPCC report itself speaks about how if you do one more in one sector, you might or you do less in one sector, you might have to compensate by doing more in another sector and vice versa. So these scenarios basically make assumptions about what uh, actions are required in certain sectors, but they by no means are sacrosanct in terms of uh, whether the same climate responses will not be possible if you have different sectoral strategies. And again, I think uh, speaking more importantly to the work that we have done, uh, the SPM of Working Group 3 says quite clearly that the scenarios contain regionally differentiated assumptions and outcomes. And careful recognition of these assumptions. Uh, but what the reasons and outcomes are hasn't been clear. I think it is uh, important to first outline this uh, entire framework. So the working group three um, uh, mitigation scenarios are basically the, the, the scenarios where the social economic assumptions are constructed and put into the uh, IMs. The IMs produced the, produce the emissions tra trajectories that are then um, assessed for their warming and impact, warming levels and impacts in by working group one and uh, vulnerability and adaptation needs by working group two. Now, there are some differences in terms of which scenarios and how they are assessed, et cetera. But what we are focused on is the working group three mitigation scenarios, uh, model scenarios. So the uh, Working Group 3 called for scenarios, so this was uh, a call that was theoretically open to everybody. Anybody could have submitted scenarios to the database, but there was a vetting criteria which uh, ensured that um, there are, uh, that which set up some particular conditions under which almost or more than half of the scenarios that were submitted to the IPCC were actually uh, uh, not considered in the ass final assessment of the IPCC. So out of the 2,425 scenarios, only 1,202 uh, were finally assessed. It passed the uh, vetting criteria. Now, some of the criteria is much more straightforward, such as, uh, for example, uh, the requirement that the emissions have to be reported. I mean, that is a very obvious criteria, but there are others that say that emissions have to go up to 2100, for example, which is uh, it, it's unclear why that should be part of the vetting criteria for which models uh, and which scenarios would.
the other scenarios correspond to the 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius uh, Paris Agreement temperature goals. Uh, the others are for higher temperature, uh, higher warming levels. Out of these 700, 556 have a 10 region classification. All of the scenarios have regional classification that underlies it. Uh, a lot of chapter three in working group three uh, really focuses on the global results and the global trajectories. But there are other chapters in working group three that provide detailed discussions on the regional results of these scenarios. Chapter six, for example, and even chapter seven to a certain extent, and even chapter 15 uh, provides uh, some of these uh, regional breakup of the results. Uh, however, chapter three, which is where the scenarios really are uh, ex uh, discussed in detail, does not go into uh, beyond a certain uh, level, does not go into the regional uh, discussion. But all of these scenarios have an underlying regional classification. Some have a five or six region classification and some have 10. So a majority of them, in fact, have a 10 region classification, 556. These 556 scenarios come from 21 integrated assessment models. And I think, um, uh, you know, when Jairaman speaks later, he will talk a little bit more in detail about these 21 integrated assessment models and whether or not there are any differences between these models. Uh, but it is important here to point out that out of these, uh, so out of these 556 scenarios, 337 scenarios, which is 61%, come from just one a model intercomparison project, right? So it's very clear that the scenarios that are assessed by the IPCC are not a statistical sample. Uh, there is no valid statistical sampling technique that has been applied to select these particular uh, 1,202 scenarios. And yet, what we see in the language of the IPCC's uh, summary for policymakers, as well as the full report, is a language of statistical distributions. Results are provided in terms of summary assessments, in terms of medians uh, and fifth to ninth percentile. Here are some examples, uh, uh, for example, on emissions in table SPM1, uh, it is made clear that the fifth to 95th percentile values across pathways are considered uh, on model scenarios. Again, on GDP growth, for example, uh, fifth to 95th percentile are considered. On cost of mitigation, the reference scenarios consider the 25th and 75th percentile values, uh, not even the 5th and 95th. Uh, or, and in bullet C.3.2 on fossil fuels, uh, very understandably, this was perhaps the most, this is the bullet, one bullet that has been picked up the most by media in terms of its, uh, in, in terms of its reporting of the results of the IPCC. Both medians and interquartile ranges are reported. Which means in a distribution, what are what is chopped off are the tails. Uh, so the extreme values are not considered. But given that this is not a st statistical distribution, uh, there might be countries and governments, policymakers who might be in fact interested in some of those extreme values. Uh, I'll just give one example. For example, in all these are all the C1 scenarios that report values for per capita GDP for sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you see a huge range, right? Uh, and the highest range, highest value that Sub-Saharan Africa reaches in 2050 uh, for, for per capita GDP is 16,500. Now, even the highest range is pretty low, considering uh, that all developed countries are at much higher levels of GDP per capita even today. So this is a projected value for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2050. So, but if you take the 5th to 95th percentile, this value goes down to, the highest value goes down to 14,000. The lower values don't change too much in this uh, because there are too many, there are many scenarios projecting very low values of GDP per capita for Sub-Saharan Africa. But the highest values, and maybe the region of Sub-Saharan Africa may be interested in those scenarios which project at least uh, $16,000 uh, per person for 2050. But in the 5th to 95th percentile, those uh, scenarios get chopped off. In the interquartile range, uh, they get chopped off even further. It goes down to $11,000 per person. And if you only report the median, what is reported is $8,000 per person per year. Right? And so uh, given that uh, you know, there might be regions which are interested in, in the higher and the, the highest uh, possible, the scenarios that project 
better outcomes in terms of GDP and consumption for them. Uh, there, there might be countries that are interested in scenarios that project lower levels of GDP and consumption for the developed countries, but these scenarios get chopped off in uh, the way in which summary assessments are provided by the IPCC. This is again an example, but this is Sub-Saharan Africa again for energy. Uh, this is with all scenarios. At, so the highest is about 40 gigajoules. Again, pretty low, but at least 40 gigajoules. Uh, fifth to 95th, it get, goes down a little bit to 38 gigajoules. Goes to 26 gigajoules in the interquartile range. And if you look at the median, it goes to 24 gigajoules. And the median value, in fact, reduces the per capita energy consumption of sub-Saharan Africa. Doesn't even increase it between 2020 and 2040. There's a reduction that is projected. So uh, we will present. So this is, I mean, to just to illustrate the point that the kind of summary assessments that are provided uh, uh, are, uh, you know, there is there is a problem there, a very serious problem, especially given that the scenarios that are assessed in the IPCC are not a statistical distribution. What we do, what we will present in terms of our results now is the analysis of these 556 scenarios, which are divided into four categories. You see, there are very few scenarios that are there for C1 uh, category, uh, much. C1 and C2, both countries, the first one with no limited overshoot, the second one with overshoot uh, of uh, some extent for some decades, uh, th these numbers vary. C3 is 2 degrees Celsius for a greater than 67% probability. C4 is 2 degrees Celsius for greater than 50%. I'm sorry, that is a mistake there. It's not 59, it's a 50% probability. Uh, we, we, after this scenario classification, we look at uh, uh, the total cumulative emissions that result for each region from each scenario. And we use a bin size of 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide and classify these scenarios based on where they fall in terms of this cumulative emissions uh, categorization. And then each for all these variables, our uh, each of the bins are uh, remain constant. And what we calculate is a weighted average uh, for across different variables for variables that we estimate per capita values for. So for example, uh, energy, fossil fuel use, et cetera, we look at per capita values. And here we look at a weighted average across all models. It's possible to do for per capita estimates and not for absolute estimates because the regional classification varies across models. So if you use population in the denominator, you have some kind of normalization across the uh, models, but uh, you can't do that with absolute values. So CO2 sequestration, emission flows, uh, cumulative emissions, also we look at, and these are reported by model. We also then look at what the fair share uh, of the global carbon budget is for every region, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is the model share, what is the share of the global carbon budget that the models allocate to each region. So uh, let me get into the results uh, directly. What we have in terms of per capita energy consumption is that uh, the total primary energy consumption, uh, and this is not just fossil fuels, this includes renewable energy. So total primary consumption itself is severely restricted in developing countries, especially in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. These are the C1 category scenarios. Uh, if you see North America, uh, all the bars in red or reddish bars are Annex 1 regions broadly, and all the remaining blue bars or bluish bars are the non-Annex 1 regions broadly. So across different scenario categories, C1, C2, C3, C4, the developed countries, Annex 1 regions continue to have much higher levels of per capita energy consumption in 2050 as compared to uh, uh, per capita energy consumption in developing regions. Between the highest and the lowest, that's North America and Sub-Saharan Africa, the difference is of seven times. And this is in 2050, right? So it's, uh, it's in fact, in some cases, it is more than the difference uh, that we observe today. So not only are inequalities projected to continue into the future, uh, they, are, they are even projected to uh, increase at times. So, so in C4 category, 
which is the two degrees Celsius uh, 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 scenario category with 50% probability, which means there is more of a carbon budget available here, which means there is more flexibility. We've heard a lot of arguments that said, say that, uh, you know, but 1.5, the carbon budget is so constrained that it's impossible for, uh, uh, you know, much change to happen. However, in C4, that is not the case. The carbon, there is more carbon budget available. There is, therefore, more flexibility available. But what, that, what happens is the models allocate even more energy and even more, therefore, even fossil fuel consumption to developed countries as we go from 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. So the world doesn't become easier in terms of mitigation for developing countries. It, been, it remains just as hard. It becomes easier, in fact, for the developed countries. Uh, this is the difference between actual values in 2019 and uh, values in 2050. Uh, North America is extremely high, uh, currently higher than most other regions. Uh, it reduces its, en uh, its energy consumption, gets reduced, uh, and so does the energy consumption in Western Europe. But it continues to remain high and much higher uh, than all other developing regions, even in 2050. In fact, the Middle East has the highest uh, reduction in energy consumption, even though its uh, reduction is starting at lower rates than North America. Um, and as a result, what you see is uh, you have um, you have all developed regions. In fact, reforming economies in Pacific OECD energy consumption increases. All developed regions shown in red here in 2050 have a higher per capita energy consumption. You see, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia have a very low levels currently, but their levels increase only marginally as we go to 2050. This holds true across all scenario categories, not just uh, C1, which is 1.5, but also C3. This higher energy use is facilitated by higher per capita use of fossil fuels. This is fossil fuel consumption, all fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. You have, uh, look at C1 category scenarios uh, that you see here. So the uh, North America, for example, has the highest per capita use of fossil fuels. Uh, and if you see the change that happens for North America and Western Europe between scenario categories C1 and C4, they get, uh, they get to use more fossil fuel per capita when they go from, when we go from scenario category C1, 1.5, scenario category C4, which is two degrees. Here. However, there is hardly any change for South Asia. Right? The fossil fuel consumption in South Asia uh, per capita is low today. It will continue to be low and much lower than developed countries in 2050. And even when you have a higher carbon budget, the fossil fuel consumption in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and other develop, uh, developing regions also will continue to be lower. The higher carbon budget, therefore, uh, means there will be more free riding and more grabbing of the carbon space by developed countries. This is basically, we are not saying this. This is what the scenarios are suggesting is going to happen in their uh, projections for 2050. Fossil fuel use con continues to remain high in developed countries. This is coal. We have coal, oil, and gas here. The first, th these uh, bars that you see, the red are Annex 1, the blue are non-Annex 1. Uh, the lighter shade is coal, the darkish, the, the uh, shade darker than that is oil, and the darkest shade is gas. Uh, so this is coal consumption. If you see the coal consumption uh, in Pacific OECD, uh, North America, reforming economies everywhere is high, except for Ch in China. All other developing countries have lower fossil fuel consumption per capita. Of course, gas con uh, oil consumption is uh, is what uh, continues to remain high again in developed countries, and so does gas consumption. So if you take the total consumption of fossil fuels, again, uh, across the developed countries, you have much higher, uh, higher consumption uh, of oil and gas, uh, definitely, but even of coal. Uh, and this is projections done before uh, what, what is happening right now. So perhaps if we have the base year starting in 2022, where developed countries are reopening coal mines and are restarting, uh, uh, are increasing their coal consumption, maybe these projections will be even more 
even in terms of coal for the future for developed countries. What happened? Not going ahead. It takes okay. a little time lag. Okay. So, the continued use of fossil fuel in developed countries, uh, developed countries is balanced basically by higher sequestration in developing regions. Uh, this is these are results in absolute terms. So then, uh, uh, so what we are presenting here uh, is for the are for results for the message Globiome 1.1 model. This is the message models together. Three message models constitute about 25% of the scenarios. The remind models have about 26% of the scenarios. Uh, and so uh, we have in the paper uh, represented results for other models as well. But if you see uh, where does the sequestration happen and the, the, the amount of sequestration is fairly significant. So this is the total CO2 sequestration from carbon capture and sequestration, CCS. So this includes uh, BECs, DACs, et cetera, all of that, and land use, which is largely afforestation. So what this particular model, for example, is saying for the C1 scenarios is that 233 gigatons of CO2 will be sequestered before the point of net zero uh, through CCS and 148 gigatons will be sequestered before the point of, this is not after net zero, this is before net zero is reached, uh, 148 gigatons through land use. If you see the, uh, this is the amount of sequestration that happens in the developed regions. Uh, less than a quarter, and this is the amount of sequestration uh, through both CCS and uh, uh, land use, that is afforestation, that is to happen from developing region. Um, that is. So at this uh, basically trend that you see here holds across all, all models, uh, with very few exceptions. In fact, EPPA, the EPPA model is the only exception and which has only one scenario in the C3 category. So it really doesn't count. But if you look at across the models that report values for these uh, variables, you see uh, the distribution to be fairly similar, much higher levels of CO2 sequestration in the developing countries with much lower in the developed countries. This is for the earlier graph was for C1 scenarios. What you see here now is for C3 scenarios. With this, I, I will hand over to Jaraman for the next part of the presentation. Uh, so thank you, Tejal. And uh, just before I start, let me thank uh, Professor Silesh Nai for the hospitality of NIAS so that we could present uh, this uh, seminar in the form that we wished. So to continue where uh, uh, my colleague left off. So per capita emissions continue to be remain higher in Annex 1 countries. Uh, so if you look at what happens in uh, C1 scenarios, of course, there's some negative emissions and some positive emissions uh, per capita emissions in the C1 scenario, but in C2, uh, you know, there are uh, Annex 1 countries which uh, have uh, per capita emissions which are still substantially, which are still substantial. Uh, there is a clear pattern that if you, in these scenarios, let me repeat, uh, we are all grateful that this is not actually the real world. And uh, so in the C3 scenarios, you find that uh, more is allocated to developed countries and by C4, which is the uh, full two degrees centigrade scenarios, there, of course, you have uh, a much higher level of per capita emissions continuing from uh, developed regions. What is particularly to be noted is the low per capita emissions that are constantly assigned with very minor rise to South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular in all these scenarios. So if you look at the kind of, uh, so you know, this is the uh, story of two.
bits of what we should be doing between 2020 and 2030. And there, of course, you find that in these uh, models, there are a number of scenarios, I know, the, uh, there are a number of uh, situations, and you find that uh, developing countries have some developing regions, I would say, have a higher emissions reduction uh, than a developed uh, regions. So you see uh, some that are uh, highlighted. Uh, so you look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, in the remind model, it is minus 10% uh, or uh, minus 11%. In the message model, it is even higher. So emissions actually are supposed to decline in these uh, models starting two years ago, if you go by what the models are saying. And this, of course, if you look at the reductions and compare it to the reductions of developed uh, regions, they are substantially uh, lie easier on the developed region. So the burden sharing, even in the short term, is of immediate uh, emissions reduction in a substantial way, even in, uh, in developing countries, even more than is being asked for in several developed regions. So all this, of course, leads to the overall continued disproportionate use of the global carbon budget. So the population share of the NX1 is 19%. It is unlikely to change dramatically over the next uh, three decades, if only to reduce. But their uh, contribution to historical non-Lulu CFCO2 emissions till 2019 was 68%. But if you look at the, say, the uh, remind uh, class of uh, scenarios and look at C1 scenarios, at the end of it all, once global net zero is reached, the Annex 1 would be, still have taken 58% of the uh, total carbon budget. And if you look at C3 scenarios, it is only moderately uh, lower at 53%. It's not as if there is a proportionate decline uh, in their share with a larger budget. So if you look, of course, then you will see what the non-annex one, we, they have to make do currently with, uh, you know, uh, only uh, one-fifth of the carbon budget for 1.5, for instance. But going forward, they would still get uh, less, you know, uh, much less than their share of the population, which is about uh, upwards of 80%. So it's either 42% in C1 or 47% in C3. Now, I just would like to make the point that, you know, whenever we talk about carbon budgets, there's always this uh, sort of response we get that tells us that carbon budgets are simply some abstract number and they do not speak to actual actions, etc. So I hope this presentation uh, as a co-benefit also provides you an idea of how the uh, disproportionate use of the global carbon budget actually reflects all kinds of inequalities in uh, fossil fuel consumption, in emissions, in energy uh, use, etc. But of course, uh, uh, how does this all work out economically? So, you know, the developing countries are very used to hearing that uh, 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 going green is an opportunity that perhaps if you take some extreme versions, that 1.5 perhaps is an even better opportunity than 2 degrees. But what you see here is in these models, you see none of that. So GDP growth, per capita GDP grows uh, multiple times, you would say, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, a factor of three but you must remember that it goes from 3,000 to 9,000 in PPP terms. Uh, North America grows by only a fraction, from, but then it is 54,000 USD to 72,000 USD. So there is substantial inequality which is baked into this kind of scenario building in GDP. Now, uh, 
Uh, this happens also in the C3 scenarios, not very different. Uh, there are stark inequalities in consumption. If you look at uh, good consumption of goods and services in C1 scenarios, in 2010 dollars, uh, the growth is threefold in sub-Saharan Africa, but that is merely going from one to three. South Asia is projected to be one to four, whereas the high consumers continue to consume. Huh? Uh, and even here, it is uh, quite remarkable that the consumption is actually not just a fractional increase, but almost doubling, at least. So, you know, in fact, it virtually doubles uh, for uh, Western Europe, Pacific OECD, and North America. So, this is, uh, uh, so you have also in uh, C1 scenarios, so before I turn to why this happens, you know, it's very important to remember that this is to be expected. And I will just briefly explain why it is baked into the model structure itself and not just scenarios. But the point is um, uh, energy and uh, uh, energy for development, energy for economic growth and emissions are related. Energy use, et cetera, are related. So if you find drastic restriction of the growth of uh, uh, fuel, uh, uh, fuel energy consumption and fuel use, and you see that they are highly unequal, then it, is, it cannot be achieved except by also restricting the growth and consumption in developing countries. So uh, an important question which we have I've just started to explore, but I we believe it is very important to share this, uh, what observations we have at this point, is why do model scenarios make such predictions? So, uh, as all uh, modelers and uh, scientists in general who use quantitative techniques, uh, including social scientists, would tell you the uh, basic rule is modeled outputs reflect the assumptions that are put in. So it is not as if the model has a mind of its own. So uh, more facetiously, uh, as grad students would tell you, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, all the scenarios are based on quantitative models. This is a vetting criterion that the IPCC has used uh, as uh, Tejal has already pointed out, there is a narrow base of models, uh, 21, not 20. And in fact, uh, models share many characteristics and some are in fact maybe cloned from the others. About two dominant models account for 50% of scenarios. Now, you will find that these two are labeled message and globium, remind the magpie, the hyphenation appeared as a result of 1.5 uh, target, we believe. And since the 1.5 target is fairly impossible to achieve without serious assumptions on, on uh, absorption in the carbon dioxide removal in the FOLU sector and carbon uh, capture uh, and storage, uh, therefore, uh, vegetation models have been attached to it. So what was message earlier becomes message globium and remind becomes remind magpie. They share very similar uh, basic characteristics. Uh, uh, the other models we will investigate uh, in time. Uh, so look at the uh, first problem which we have noticed is uh, about the energy module in uh, both these models, shared perhaps by others. It was a problem which was pointed out in the text, uh, unfortunately buried inside the chapter, uh, almost noted in passing. Uh, among the co-authors is the distinguished economist of uh, global inequality in a certain sense, Professor Lance Taylor and collaborators. So they point out very clearly, and this was an observation made in the case of special report on 1.5 degrees, but applies here to AR6 as well. First of all, the models all assume 
that drastic energy GDP decoupling is possible. That's the first assumption. So the, as a consequence of this assumption, you can model a situation or you can sort of project a scenario, whatever be the reality, that GDP growth continues uh, at a moderate pace at least or at, according to historical trends, but primary energy falls faster than ever historically known. So, uh, primary, so you uh, demand a decoupling that has no precedence. This reduction in energy demand is assumed to be driven partly by more efficient renewables, but this is not enough. So the second aspect of these models uh, with regard to energy is that the rest of the reduction in energy demand, which then drives uh, various uh, other things, including emissions in these models, is achieved by restricting energy demand in a, uh, uh, historically speaking, equally drastic fashion. So as a result, uh, and uh, we have already seen this, and uh, what our analysis shows that the reduction in energy demand uh, where, uh, by uh, restricting energy demand is happens because the burden of it is on the developing countries and not the developed countries. Of course, this happens because you apply it, uh, the sort of uh, the rule Algorithm is applied equally to developed and developing countries. So if you have countries that are at the level of, say, sub-Saharan Africa in terms of energy consumption, then, of course, they, are, uh, they, they, will, uh, they will be projecting an absolute decrease for energy consumption for this. So the question is, is this feasible? And uh, you will find that uh, the paper says very clearly, achieving the projected absolute decoupling alongside successful industrialization, meaning developing countries, presents an unresolved policy challenge. Amen. So there are more fundamental issues that we have at stake here. This is one aspect of it. But there is a real starting point problem, meaning the very nature of the models we use. Uh, and this is that the, I dare say it is all the models, but certainly it is absolutely true of the two models which I am discussing here. The basic techniques have no room for any form of distributional justice. So historical responsibility which of course speaks to the question of distributional justice in the future with regard to fuel use, with regard to uh, access to carbon space and so on and so forth, and eventually growth and development given the interlinkages. Basically, it is off the table as far as these models are concerned. They were never even in consideration to begin with. So these are based on what is called intertemporal Pareto optimization. You can look up the uh, wiki of uh, the models and you can see this uh, spelled out clearly. Uh, it is transparently, the information is available. But these optimization techniques are well known for the fact they do not account for inequalities nor how these <laughs> inequalities came about. Now, of course, Working Group 2, uh, in its uh, SPM, notes that uh, inequalities in the world and uh, the uh, difficulties of climate resilient development for developing countries versus developed countries depends on a number of things, and that includes even colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, inequality, so whatever be the historical background, of uh, where the economy starts, where the modeling begins, the scenarios are projected from, how they came about is not on the table. So inequalities in resources, endowment, inequality in productive capacities are all ignored. Uh, this is a very, in fact, if you look at the development economics literature, this is a basic well-known feature of what is known as Pareto optimality. 
In fact, you could have in models of say two countries, you could have one country having everything and another country having nothing. By the criterion of optimality, this would still be an optimal distribution. Explicitly in these models, though they might account for trade, etc., there are no distributional transfers. They are considered too high. They are ruled out by fiat. This goes back, I believe, to the original techniques that have inspired many of these models. So uh, all integrated assessment models use some version of such optimization. Uh, we, however, you know, there are uh, uh, important theoretical papers uh, that have uh, looked at uh, related questions. And uh, I just point out one that uh, I am familiar with uh, by Sudhir Anand and Amartya Sen, uh, where in a small technical uh, calculation, they point out that optimality and sustainability are two independent criteria. And by sustainability, they make it clear that is not merely fulfilling a carbon constraint, but sustainable in economic and social terms as well. So you allow for increasing consumption and capital. Minimum standard of living, in fact, they show is a third independent constraint and technology development a critical factor. So, in fact, it would be very interesting to analyze some of the, these scenarios and how these models work based on these criteria. And I'm sure there's much more. Uh, in fact, a huge literature on the in development economics uh, on these issues, but which, however, are not reflected in the work of the scenario builders. So, uh, to wrap up, what are the overall findings of this equity assessment of these scenarios? The first good news, uh, we must always begin with the good news. The good news is that these are only projections by some scientists of how the world looks at the future. Uh, of course, you know, science is an ongoing project, but they, so it means in no way means that uh, the world has to be in this way. Uh, what it calls for is greater imagination. What it calls for is new techniques. It calls for new ways of thinking about the problem. For instance, you might argue that Pareto optimality is standard in economics. But then uh, one might uh, retort that it is standard economics, perhaps that got us to the climate crisis. And so uh, if we are to come out of the climate crisis, then some kind of non-standard approach to the uh, world in terms of economics is required. But more specifically about coming to these scenarios and uh, of special importance, I think, to policymakers, the projected 2050 is an unequal world that perpetuates or aggravates the inequality of today. And uh, I would say to court across the board, the, The inequalities are pervasive, as I've just pointed out, with respect to all uh, variables. And uh, inequalities are, uh, you know, basically, I would say not only they don't restrain any transformative growth, perhaps there is not even room for including a transformative growth uh, in this kind of uh, uh, model. So to continue, Developed countries continue to draw a disproportionate share of the remaining carbon budget. And uh, we repeat once again that this is not an abstract statement. The diminishing character of the remaining carbon budget does not take away from, this, from its salience for uh, global climate policy because it shows how clearly the uh, inequalities are getting baked in, even though the carbon budget is rapidly shrinking. Uh, the other point about the carbon budget is, uh, is of course, it calls out the fact that uh, free riding. You see here in all these scenarios that the high emissions 
of the uh, developed countries, relatively higher emissions of developed countries, their higher uh, growth uh, GDP levels, their higher consumption. All of this is uh, built in, in some sense, on the free riding of the uh, use of carbon space by the uh, developed countries. So the carbon budget perspective is important in this regard. The share of fossil fuel use in these uh, 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 developed countries is also projected to increase. Ah. So in the C1 scenarios, all developing regions uh, begin emissions reduction in 2020. So that, of course, uh, is uh, well known. In other scenarios, the peaking year is only slightly delayed, progressively from C2 to C4, uh, over uh, about a decade as you go through these various uh, uh, categories of scenarios. Uh, so basically, what is the story? So developed country fossil fuel use that remains disproportionately high, the disproportionate use of the even the shrinking remaining carbon budget is to be counterbalanced by developing country sinks. So as uh, a distinguished colleague of mine has always pointed out, this means to put it in plain language that our forests are your dustbins of your carbon. Uh, or to put it in more poetic language, uh, the world that is envisaged is, uh, as you would say, from, uh, you know, in an English metaphor, that developing countries would continue to remain chewers of wood and drawers of water. And uh, whereas uh, the benefits of growth, the modernity, industrialization would uh, accrue in substantially greater part to the developed world. So uh, model scenarios. Uh, so if there is more, unfortunately, in these models, it is not shared. When there is more, more is given to those who have. And this is a famous line from the Bible, which says, to who, uh, to who hath more shall be given, and what little he has shall be taken away. And this seems like a good metaphor a biblical metaphor on which to more or less uh, conclude our uh, analysis, equity analysis of these, uh, uh, of these scenarios. Uh, and so uh, we have made the point about free riding. And this, of course, therefore, cannot be the basis for mitigation policy making. So uh, we need more work in the science, but in the meantime, uh, I think the basic principles that speak to equitable allocation of global resources of the global commons is a far more fruitful and equitable way to imagine our future than complex modeling exercises, which regrettably do not take us in the direction of equity and climate justice. So with these words, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jairam and uh, to Tejan uh, providing the analysis of the this, uh, scenarios and uh, your views on the different aspects. And I think the uh, important thing which uh, I thought what you would like to convey is that the equity continue to maintain the inequality which we have. <laughs> so I think the very much definition of equity itself, I think is uh, they have modified and that is how they are trying to work. But I what is in this that we uh, also need to have our own uh, assumptions and the what we would like to include uh, 
about the quality of life which you said that what is that minimum quality of life should be ensured for the entire world and for the distribution has to take into account that aspect as well and i think currently it is not uh, been done and that is one of the very important point which you have made so thank you very much uh, both of you and uh, i would uh, invite uh, richa sharma ji to have any comment and then we will open for the uh, question answer yes i can already see some raised hands so i'm going to be extremely brief and i would only say that this work points up the need actually for uh, the global scientific community actually, worldwide for uh, the global to, scientific community worldwide Is there an echo? Is there an echo? Uh, I think you should continue because I can. Uh, when I speak, I can hear an echo. I see Dr. Pradeepto Ghosh's hand is up, and perhaps you would like to give the floor to him. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Richa Sharma. Uh, I have to go in a few minutes, so therefore I'll. I'm grateful that you have given me the floor this early in the discussion. And first of all, I would like to congratulate Tejal and Professor Jairaman for this splendid piece of work that they have done. Now, I would just like to address a few questions that arise from this presentation, and I would like to say that you know, like to clarify where I'm coming from. I have been a modeler for many years in both the uh, both the different modeling philosophies that are involved in these 20 models, that is, you know, bottom up, uh, uh, bottom up CG models, computable general equilibrium models, and and top down uh, and top down uh, linear programming models like Markle that we use in Teddy. Now, what well, what exactly is driving these results? And uh, since I have been uh, formally involved with several construction of these several of these scenarios in the IPC in the ISA uh, research programs called C Links and Engage, and I know what the, where the researchers are coming from. Uh, let me say that where most of these models come from is that of equating marginal costs of carbon mitigation across different regions, and this you know gives what Professor Jaraman has been calling Pareto optimality. Economists would generally say that, look, in a uh, in a bottom up model, it would be, you know, it would be global cost minimization of mitigation in a in a in a uh, in a CG kind of model. It would mean that globally minimizing the costs of uh, of mitigation of the of a global target. Now. You know, in uh, Tejal in her first or second slide, mentioned about an IPCC uh, caveat, which says that where the emissions reductions take place is not where necessarily who has to pay for it. And I think the problem really arises that the second part of the statement has not been acted upon by, by these models. They, they have recognized that this needs to be done and it has not been done. And if the implicit financial flows that would come out of adopting global cost minimization and an explicit equity formula were to be built into the modeling format, then the results, both in terms of economic outcomes as well as in allocations of carbon space or energy, uh, energy per capita may look very different. The point is that this aspect has in fact not been done. And here it is, I would like to reiterate that the question of equity in in, in formulating these models may be done in two ways. You can give a GAG allocation by, in, uh, by region, uh, which has been implicitly done in this study, uh, or you can give that you can see that financial flows are, are, are to take place according to a certain formula, and which is really the missing, missing element. Uh, now, the, the second part, that is the financial flows, they will arise from uh, from any any scheme where you have GH allocations across regions and a global carbon market. 
but the GHG allocations across regions have to be done explicitly according to some or some equity formula. Mm -hmm. And of course, the modelers have not done this. They have just looked at the existing uh, existing emiss emissions across regions. They have implicitly assumed that this is the GHG allocations, mm -hmm. and then they have looked at what it would take for the globe to reach a certain GHG allocation uh, target. Yeah, can you please yeah. uh, frame your question so that? Because there are many hands up and it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's an explanation, not really a question. OK, OK. Yeah. So uh, I, it's an explanation for where these results are coming from. And I'm not justifying it, but I'm as a modeler, I'm explaining how these results arise. It arises from the fact that the second part of the IPCC's caveat has not been acted upon by the modelers and acting upon the second part would require an explicit, uh, explicit, uh, the explicit assumption of equity which has not been done. Now, uh, 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 so I mean, what really is the remedy? I mean, the remedy really is to go back to the drawing board for these, and you know, in the in the IPCC, uh, you know, discussions where you know for the seventh uh, assessment report, uh, the terms of reference are uh, are evolved. Uh, then, in that case, the representatives of the government of India, in uh, along with the you know along with that of other developing countries must explicitly put in the terms of reference for the AR7 studies that the that explicit equity assumptions must be built into these models in one of two forms either as GHG allocations across regions and alternatively as financial yeah. flows uh, in respect of the of the of the costs of GHG mitigation across regions. So this has to be done. If this is not there in the IPC ter terms of reference, the modelers won't act upon it. Now, one one suggestion to the to Tejal and uh, and Dr. Jairaman and I've had the pleasure of working with them over many years is that you know your equity assumptions remain implicit. At some point, you know you're talking of of uh, uh, of per capita GHGs. At some point, you're talking of per capita uh, you know uh, of uh, of per capita energy use, uh, you, it's not clear where historical responsibility is coming from. Whether you have at all taken historical responsibility into account, uh, whether you have in some places it looks like you know you are concerned about the about the per capita income uh, as uh, per capita income consequences of these of these models. So my suggestion would be that you know as you as you sort of work further on this paper, make explicit upfront what your equity assumptions are. Uh, whether you are talking of per capita GHG, per capita uh, incomes, per capita, 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 capita uh, energy use, and the extent to which you are uh, taking historical responsibility. Uh, so that's all I have to say. I will, I will so see how to get comments in my responses to the paper. Thank you very much, and once again, congratulations to Kajal and Dr. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Tejal, would you like to quickly? Uh, can but, take uh, a few more questions. Uh, that, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, for your uh, very kind remarks, your encouragement, and your uh, observations. Uh, I do believe that uh, uh, you know the part of the exercise uh, consists in actually reducing the required finances that developing countries would need because. Uh, if you project growth and development uh, to be at such low levels, and if you project the growth of per capita consumption of energy to be so low, then the assumption you are, and you assume such high levels of energy GDP uh, decoupling, uh, then obviously the claims on the financial uh, uh, transfers or assistance required yes. would be minimal. But then that would have to come extraneously. Uh, currently, these models by and large don't have any uh, way that distributional effects, uh, uh, large transfers are uh, can be put in. Uh, one model which claims to be a different uh, utilitarian model of emissions allocation actually explicitly forbids any such transfer, and at least you know it is transparently stated up front. So I think. Uh, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, that is what uh, uh, I would like to say at this point. So I think the problem is a little more fundamental than Professor Ghost that Dr. Ghost that you said, but that is for another occasion. 
So the second uh, part of uh, Dr. Winkler's question that I see in the chat, uh, I would uh, leave to my colleague. But the first part, I would say, if there is such a real, uh, you know, low energy future that is possible, uh, as you pointed out, someone brought up, uh, then, you know, the answer to what we should do is uh, in the climate convention, develop the countries, please uh, take the lead, show us how it is done. Right now, it would be very difficult for policymakers uh, in uh, developing countries to say, yes, your models are like this. We are going to restrict and growth and development, but there is a new imagination possible that is not captured by the uh, models, uh, and uh, that is what we need to follow. If there is one, please let us know, and we would be uh, delighted to follow. This, I believe, should be the response of uh, developing country policy makers. Hand over to my colleague, Tejal. Yeah, no, I think there are also specific references to the IMP LD, um, you know, low demand uh, pathways that are uh, considered in the thing. I think even if you look at those specific pathways, one is, of course, in the way in which the IPCC uh, Chapter 3 results, as well as overwhelmingly results are presented in the summary for policymakers. Um, it becomes very difficult to pick out individual pathways. And then this is done in even in the summary for policymakers and in, in their different IPCC outreach events, individual pathways for specific characteristics are picked out. But what you but the overall message is provided in terms of summary assessments, right? And so uh, I showed some graphs of uh, what happens when you uh, remove some of the um, some of the out some of the tails, right? Fifth to ninety fifth percentile, etc. Some of the models that show slightly at least better performance on economic parameters for developing countries get chopped off in that kind of assessment. But the IMP LD, uh, in, in fact, in many parameters uh, restricts energy, so it might be uh, it may not necessarily be chopped off in the fifth to ninety fifth or interquartile percentiles. But it restricts energy growth in developing countries based on assumptions of efficiency improvements uh, across scenarios, which are efficiency improvements that happen at low levels of GDP and consumption growth. They, it's it's not as if our energy uh, uh, you know our energy consumption is correlated with high levels of GDP growth and is then still less. Uh, so I, we one could understand if you are saying that we will have. $56,000, but we will do it at a fraction of the energy that uh, Western Europe or uh, North America did it at. That's not what is happening. Even in the IMPLDs, what is happening is that once you restrict development and you restrict growth, you restrict GDP, you restrict consumption, and then you say even this has to happen at extremely high levels of efficiency, so you restrict energy growth further. So I think that is uh, an important point about even the IMPs uh, that needs to be understood. So even if you call out these individual scenarios and take a look at them, uh, they have they embed the, these problems. The other issue is the fairness criteria, whether the carbon budget can be dis can be shared on the basis of other criteria, not just a per capita uh, per capita uh, criteria. Of course, I mean there is enough literature. Uh, as, uh, this question is from Professor Winkler. I mean he's the author of some of this uh, literature. So I'm, I'm, I, you know, and we've written things together on this. There is, there are enough alternative approaches uh, that look look at different criteria that should also be included, uh, weighing by GDP, weighing by HDI, uh, human development indicators in terms of allocations for the future, and this is all on the table. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, there is just like there are no. Uh, this is all up for discussion and debate. Unfortunately, in the entire discussion of what constitutes best available science today this is not this discussion itself is not even on the table that is the problem right if you say that yes we need to have some allocation criteria for a fair consideration of the carbon budget but let's discuss what that criteria is then we have somewhere then we have a starting point but you that but the, there is no such discussion on the table at all uh, in the ipcc reports and of course you know this reflects also in the discussions therefore in the political negotiations <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. 
ريتاش شر ครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับคร
this uh, these terms hardly put in uh, appearance. Uh, let me double check. So, in fact, uh, equity does not appear even once. Climate justice or justice does not appear once. Uh, maladaptation appears three times, uh, so on and so forth. Nature-based appears once, nature appears eight times, uh, and so on and so forth. But in an SPM text that refers to equity and climate justice 25 times to find not a single mention of it in the video uh, is, uh, we believe, uh, somewhat uh, wanting in a balanced outreach. Let me leave it at that. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. Uh, Dr. Winkler, you have any comments, sir? Uh, Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much, and uh, uh, thanks for um, uh, this very good study, the presentation, and also some uh, responses to questions I, I put into the into the chat already. I, I largely really agree. I think equity is not sufficiently built into into the global um, integrated assessment models. Um, I would say, and I'm speaking here as a CLA of Chapter Four, not Chapter Three, where most of the that literature was was, was reflected that. There are uh, parts, and we have a have a have a section on equity, including just transitions. And Jairam, and what you just mentioned in the SPM of Working Group Three, so some it's not only Chapter Four, but so there are non-modeling parts, I would say, or, or parts that draw for um, in our chapter also on national modelings. Those issues of equity and just transitions are reflected, but but that doesn't take away from your point that equity has not been sufficiently built into the global IMMs, and I completely agree they are they are very influential and and, I, and that we're due and <clears throat> indeed I've published on this exact topic with uh, with, with Sonia Klinsky of I think it becomes a question of how to build in equity and and that leads me to 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 the question that I have for for Tejal and you which is uh, well and, and I guess also <clears throat> your director do do institutions like yours like NIES have plans perhaps to develop an IM that would reflect uh, the context, uh, the concerns, the perspectives from India and perhaps uh, other perspectives from the global south. Thanks, that would be my question. Quite some time trying to develop uh, uh, scenarios that are not necessarily, I mean, I think there is a world beyond the integrated assessment models. I, I, I don't I don't necessarily subscribe uh, to the fact that we should all aspire to build an IAM. Uh, but we have uh, constructed scenarios which are um, equity-based global scenarios where the target is arriving at some um, equitable energy outcomes for everybody in the future or, uh, you know, uh, fair carbon allocation uh, scenarios for the future. Um, and what is what is uh, really tough, uh, however, is that, uh, I, I, you know, while we do a lot of work uh, uh, that is in our institutions in India, not just us, I think many institutions do it, uh, Getting some of the non-IAM, non-standard modeling work published uh, has become exponentially harder. I mean, so the so not not just is the IAM uh, literature extremely influential in terms of uh, how it impacts the perception of best available science and how much uh, uh, influence it uh, or how much weight it carries in terms of the IPCC outreach. Uh, while uh, there are other aspects that are covered, even when they are covered in the SPM or in the full report, they don't get reflected in the IPCC outreach. What gets covered really is uh, these scenarios. But alternative uh, modeling approaches and alternative scenario building approaches uh, themselves uh, get, uh, you know, are not necessarily, find it very difficult to find uh, homes uh, if I must say, for publication. So that is a, that is a challenge. But of course, you know, we are doing uh, work uh, and I hope there are others. We, hope, we do hope that... Uh, so right now, for example, 94% of the scenarios, the 556 scenarios that we've showed, 94% come from developed countries. 6% of the scenarios come from the coffee model, which is a Brazilian model. But otherwise, all of them are from developed countries. 
uh, over 80% are in fact from the Europe, from Europe, the European Union. Uh, and so there is a huge uh, problem in terms of uh, models and modeling scenarios from developing countries. Even scenarios that are there may not pass the vetting criteria that are, that are set by uh, the IPCC and so will not necessarily be reflected in the assessment. So you don't have scenarios coming from the global south and perhaps this is a huge gap that we must IAMs, non-IAMs, other kinds of scenarios. We must, uh, there must be more scenarios coming from the global south, not just coming from the global south, coming from the perspectives that, uh, uh, that inform policies in the global south. So I would just like to add that, of course, you know, we are all interested in building models and uh, one of our interests would be to go back to the drawing board and a starting point would be the uh, kind of model we published with you as part of the basic expert group, where we start with a top-down allocation of the global carbon, not top-down, uh, uh, allocation of the global carbon budget on various, you could jiggle the uh, equity criteria according to various criteria, then everybody cooperates or does it on their own and you could model economic scenarios within the global constraint. So, you know, there are multiple possibilities. And uh, basically, I think at the IPCC, perhaps a thought for the future, the uh, reports are out in the sixth cycle. Your categorization of scenarios must take what is in the literature and then categorize it. Instead of issuing a call saying, I will consider for assessment only those scenarios that pass the criteria. So I would like to know if there were 2,500 odd scenarios uh, presented, of which only 1,200 made the cut, okay? How, how many of those uh, earlier didn't pass the cut because they stopped at 2050 and didn't go up to 2100? So I would be interested in such scenarios, but uh, I have no way of finding out unless I, I go and do it personally now. So I think uh, our classification must fit the literature. I don't think we should ask the literature to fit our classification. That would be a good starting point, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Amit Garg. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, Tejal and Jaram on this presentation and work will reverberate across the world in modeling for some more time to come. And I think a, a tremendous job done. I have two, three points to, uh, to put up. I think what is coming out is that is a discussion on lifestyle should be there. That is very important. Because when you are talking about per capita consumption and some countries are at this level, some countries are at this level and you want to everybody become net zero. So there is a convergence which may happen, but before that, the growth should be allowed. So lifestyle has to be discussed in much detail that uh, whatever we, we decide that per capita or something, something. The second point is that what I also got an idea <laughs> and thought that are you hinting about consumption-based inventorization? Presently it is as is where is production-based inventorization. So all the models are going that whosoever is producing. So uh, uh, I'm not taking any side, but countries in developing world will be because they are producing for the world. Their emissions will be much higher and they, they are doing it for business. The, the, I think the third point is, comments for discussion. third point is, one, one more point I want to make is, I think national models and national scenarios had to be provided some more space in this because uh, apart from inequality, that is uh, SSP4, national models are missing a lot in IPC scenarios. So they have to be brought central stage. And of course, uh, the last point is scenario building and modeling requires long-term financial commitment and technical commitment, which uh, 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 we have to find the developing country does not, many, many teams in developing country they depend 
on resources being made available or purely for PhD or research purposes, these things happen. So they have to be maybe looked into uh, uh, very seriously by developing country governments, by, by developed country governments. How can we promote direct modeling through financing in, in developing countries, which is developing countries are presently a part of a big team. It is not the team. I think uh, uh, we should look into that. And of course, uh, yeah, I'll stop here. I have a couple of more points, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tejal, quickly. No, I, I think um, very well noted, uh, Professor Garg, uh, the comments that you raised. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the fact that focus on national models and their role. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, when, <laughs> how is policy made in a country? How many, how, and how much it depends on models uh, and these kinds of global model, uh, model projections in terms of what is going to happen in the future. The problem is that there is pressure that is built. We are increasingly seeing uh, in the political negotiations numbers that are put in uh, on the basis of these models, saying that, of course, this is the best available science. I think we heard Meena say this, uh, this understanding of the IPCC's uh, scenario results is the best available science. And therefore, you see numbers that come into the political negotiations. And so therefore, there is pressure that comes from there to look at your policy in the context of these global scenarios. But I think what we do uh, nationally is much more grounded in our realities, in, in what uh, we, in our challenges, and as well as in what we really have in terms of opportunities. And so therefore, there should be definitely more space for this. I we agree completely. Uh, in terms of sustainable consumption, I mean, um, there is really the question of uh, how consumption primary consumption in economic models is handled at this level. And if you look at the, um, the results, the outcomes for uh, uh, per capita consumption of goods and services, I mean, it is very clear that uh, it's, not very, it's not very clear what sustainable consumption and what way sustainable consumption is really addressed uh, in these models, if at all. I mean, uh, if the argument is that the sustainable consumption is to happen in developing countries where sustainable where, where consumption is already low. So you ask the poor to go on a diet. I mean, that is the uh, that, that seems to be the thrust of what the models are saying. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jaydeep. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you see, uh, I am uh, filling in for Dr. Mathur. So uh, basically, uh, you know, very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, I, uh, you know, a few points, you know, I had a look at the paper and it's very interesting. The thing is, you know, as far as my experience is concerned, uh, you know, these uh, global models, they are uh, uh, quite aggregate in nature. So I have, I work on uh, CGE models. So, uh, and I'm familiar with the CG models, uh, you know, global CG models. So basically these models do not consider uh, the nuances, the country level nuances. So that is one aspect. And of course, uh, you know, when we cons uh, talk about uh, a country like India, uh, you know, we just cannot uh, rely on such models. We have to go deeper. And therefore, you know, in this context, we have worked quite a lot on uh, India-specific models. Uh, we have uh, several publications also, CG models. Uh, so, and uh, here, you can consider uh, in equity aspects. For example, in many of our papers, we have um, estimated uh, effects on the Gini coefficient. Uh, so, so uh, you know, these aspects can be covered, but again, it depends on the type of modeling framework that is being used. So again, a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, very yeah. uh, a very quick response. Thank you very much. And perhaps that is a conversation we should continue. But I would just like to add uh, that uh, there is a small issue here that uh, even though you say that country nuances are uh, uh, not uh, uh, you know, captured by these models. 
Now, you know, once the global models are built, is uh, you know, the next round of the game is downscaling these models to produce national level results. And that concerns us even more. You know, what, what would that downscaling ent uh, entail? Now, obviously, if my global model is giving me a per capita consumption of $6,000 uh, in 2050, is downscaling going to be able to uh, going to help me make it 25,000? That's a simple question. I doubt whether downscaling is going to help me do that. So downscaling and such uh, issues are now will come to the fore. Uh, then you know global models and downscale models and national level models. So I think. Uh, uh, these are issues that we need to go into deeper. And uh, I, I do agree there are no quick answers, but uh, that should not stop us from looking for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question or should we go to chat box? I, I reach, uh, ah. Richa Sharma? She has left. Oh, no, she's said. I have I actually wanted yeah. to know whether in whether yeah. uh, you know there is a lack of uh, models that take equity into consideration uh, from scientists, and that is the reason why the IPCC is not picking them up for use in their assessment reports. And what should be done, uh, you know, for the broader scientific community to undertake this exercise so that you know at the time of the seventh assessment cycle, at least such models are then available that can be taken into the IPCC assessments. So what do you think should be done to encourage this work? Uh, but I think, uh, uh, Madam Richa Sharma, this is a very important question. Uh, I am sure uh, some of our distinguished colleagues, uh, I would uh, particularly uh, would like to uh, recognize uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, who has been uh, very, uh, I don't, uh, you know, we, we would be happy if we would like to say something, but we are not going to uh, uh, ask him to speak if he does not wish to at this time. So there are a number of uh, distinguished colleagues who are following this. And uh, so the first thing we would say is, uh, my answer, first answer to your question is yes, there is a dearth of models which take equity into account. And in a manner that uh, corresponds to, say, our understanding in India, broadly speaking, of what constitutes equity in the climate arena. That's number one. The second point is, I think, to ensure that this uh, work is carried out, and when it is carried out, it is heard. The third aspect is that uh, uh, as uh, other uh, authors have pointed out elsewhere, there are many dimensions to uh, scenarios for the future, and not all of them need be explicitly quantitative, except for some broad parameters. So in that regard, I think uh, uh, this is an attitude uh, perhaps we in a country like India are very familiar with, uh, there are a number of initiatives which are taken by uh, the, at the highest level uh, of the political leadership, at the highest levels of our administration and bureaucracy. And very many of them do not come from models. They are informed by statistics. They are informed by numbers. They are informed by data. But they are also taken with considerations which are normative, like equity, poverty, eradication, sustainability, what is socially just, you know, what is transformative. So I think uh, we, this is an experience from the global south, uh, from developing countries. And uh, I would say, I dare say people like you also with long experience in uh, administration, this is something we ought to put on the table. It just is not a matter simply of numbers. You have to inspire trust and confidence for transformation. How do we do it? And so we, we, all three levels, I think we need to revamp our idea of how we imagine the future. So I think, yes, 
technical things, yes, we should do it. We will pursue it. Encouragement and support from the uh, governments, especially in the global south, is very welcome. But uh, the scientific community should not, uh, you know, wait for it. They should take the initiative. This is perfectly well taken, I think. Uh, and hopefully by AR7, we have something uh, that can be uh, put on the table. Professor Winkler is here. Uh, we were party to this. We collaborated in the basic expert group discussion on equitable access to sustainable development. New initiatives like this are welcome. There is much to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we go to next? Yeah. Any other hand up? Anderson has a question. Yeah, ah, yes. Uh, uh, what does he say? Would he like to ask it? I suspect very few within the... I'll just repeat the question. I don't know if he's uh, still connected. Uh, Dr. Kevin Anderson, are you there? So the question is, I suspect very few within the climate community in the global north have any sense of the deep inequalities that are now normalized in our climate dialogues. How can we get the message of this event included in the global north discussions? I think there would be considerable support from many within academia and civil society and even some journalists and policymakers for ensuring these inequalities become a central part of discussions. As it is, few, if any, are aware of the deep biases underpinning the IMs and consequently the policy discourse. Uh, I would say at the outset, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are aware uh, that in various ways, including your blog, you are contributing uh, strongly to the uh, uh, making the uh, issues of equity uh, available on a, a larger scale to many more, uh, uh, to a much larger audience. I think we look forward to working with you on this uh, further. And uh, uh, we, uh, I would not speculate here on how precisely we can do it. But uh, first off, we can say that perhaps in January, late January or February, Dr. Kanitkar and I will organize a meeting we, had, we were planning one before COP27, but it became too tight. We would have a meeting in which uh, equity would be a prime area of focus and interest, and we would be delighted to have people there. So this is uh, an announcement, uh, not thought through, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, the discussion today inspires such a response. Thank you, and we look forward to having people there. Uh, Thank you. I, I just want to add uh, to this, I think, uh, in relation to the question uh, that uh, very true, perhaps that many people do not are not aware. But uh, given the reactions to uh, our paper since our paper um, that, uh, you know, we published just before COP27, in the preprint, uh, and then, of course, the presentation, there are actually enough who are aware. Uh, is what we, we realized, that uh, there are people who are aware, um, people associated with working group three as well as outside of it uh, or other working groups are aware of the issues. The question is, how is it that, uh, and why is it that they are not raised? Uh, I think, uh, you know, those of us coming from the global south uh, feel strongly enough about them to raise uh, these issues, but there are enough uh, people like you as well who raise these issues all the time. Uh, but I, I think it just is a matter of the matter of time, because now uh, there are there there are there are papers coming from uh, some of the authors of uh, chapter three that speak about financial transfers, etc. These are still, I think, uh, sort of trying to put a bandage on um, uh, uh, which where, where it would would not work, because uh, financial transfers. I think Jaraman has already spoken about what the problems are. But nevertheless, there is an acknowledgement. Even in the IPCC's uh, event on scenarios at COP27, there was an acknowledgement of equity. Uh, that was the first time that it was uh, that uh, it was addressed up front. Uh, uh, you know where, where it was not uh, in previous outreach events of the IPCC. So I think there is enough awareness. I, it, it it just needs 
to be constantly raised and put on the table. Uh, I think there are enough of us doing this. Perhaps um, we'll have better outcomes. Yeah. Dr. Srikant. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That I think I'm happy to see this sort of uh, seminar being organized by Professor Jaraman and uh, Dr. Tejal Nias. I think uh, I'm very happy that to see that, uh, you know, the additional secretary, Mr. Chai Sharma, is herself, uh, you know, agreed to co-chair. So the fundamental point, I, I agree with all that has been said by both uh, the speakers today. But uh, the point that what I wanted to suggest in terms of scenarios is to add technology. I mean, I think what would happen is in practical terms, to ask the developed countries, we can ask always, but I don't know whether the developed countries are going to reduce their per capita energy usage or their per capita fossil fuels. And what we have seen in the last uh, one year, uh, just after COP26 clearly indicates, they will do only what is good for them. They are not going to care what it does to climate or what it is going to do to global warming, etc. So they are going to do what they have to do, uh, what they want to do, and uh, therefore their per capita energy usage uh, may not come down as we want to do in our scenarios. But one suggestion I have is in terms of technology. Obviously, basically, carbon capture technology is direct air, air capture. There are many technologies that are, are uh, you know, IGCC technologies okay. to basically uh, make, uh, you know, thermal power plants, you know, have capture, capture uh, CO2 capture ready emissions. There are many technology options that are available. To, for people to continue using fossil fuels but reduce their uh, carbon emissions drastically. But all of this basically are either in the initial stages or are thought to be too costly. So can we not have a, basically a scenario where it basically says, yes, uh, Mr. Developed Country, you can, or an X1 country, you can do what you want to do, but this is your carbon budget and you may have to use or implement these sort of technologies to reduce your per capita carbon emissions while still keeping your energy uh, requirements high. So uh, can we include technology in one of the scenarios? Because what I feel, I don't think that as we have seen, the Green Climate Fund is still grossly underfunded. But if you can ask people to invest in technology in their own countries, I don't think they will mind that. Because they see that as investment, they see this as jobs growth. So it can be a positive approach uh, so that they are able to basically you know, use their skills, their finance to basically reduce carbon budget while uh, having their per capita energy emissions. Thank you. That's my session. Thank you. Thank you, Srikan. We'd like to respond. Uh, Srikan, yeah. I guess uh, mm -hmm. maybe thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, that, that the idea that, you know, you have a carbon you know, we are not asking that anybody reduce their energy uh, consumption. And uh, just as we should not be asked to reduce our energy consumption, this is a global collective action problem is really of emissions. Uh, it's not of energy. The, the point is that these are, in some sense, the emissions come from uh, energy requirements that are then uh, supplied by certain technologies. There is a huge uh, dependence, like we showed, on carbon sequestration, carbon dioxide removal technologies across the model. Uh, right, but the other uh, energy breakup in terms of uh, nuclear, how much comes from nuclear, how much comes from uh, hydro across regions, etc., is not yet clear. We should uh, dig into that a little deeper. But it is very clear that sequestration, um, the the report, the full report, in fact, speaks about uh, sequestration um, only after. I mean, the SPM focuses on the numbers for carbon dioxide removal, negative emissions, only after the point of net zero. But if you look at the amount of sequestration that these models assume before the point of global net zero or, or region, before every region reaches net zero is substantial. And therefore, uh, and a lot of it is supposed to happen in developing countries, not in developed countries. So it's not as if technology is not an aspect of the models. It's just that the scale of deployment is determined by assumptions of where it is cheapest to deploy that technology. And the assumption is that it is cheapest to do it in developing countries. So if you actually constrain it by the developed country allocations of the carbon budget, as you suggest, and this is completely something that we should try to do together, we, have, we will have different results. Perhaps. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. We yes. can take one more uh, question if it is. There is one question. 
Absolutely. Yeah, there's one question about how we can do this even before the ARC. Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate the spirit of the question, uh, a guest uh, asking by any chance from Germany, because the uh, spelling of the word uh, guest, perhaps in German. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let me not speculate. So these uh, issues and their implications, can it be raised uh, earlier? Uh, now, uh, let me say that uh, uh, the uh, synthesis report is meant to be precisely that, a synthesis of the findings of the earlier reports. Uh, it is in an uh, advanced uh, stage of uh, discussion and will be uh, the final approval session is most likely in uh, March. So, uh, given the circumstances, this is also a place where, having made the journey so far, uh, we uh, would like, in a collegial manner, having reflected on the earlier three reports, to put together a synthesis report, which is of value. Having said that, uh, the some of the issues uh, we are concerned with on equity in broader terms have been noted earlier in extenso in the SPMs of the three working groups. So that certainly will add to the quality of the synthesis report. Uh, we would also add that at the end of the day, these synthesis reports are uh, fairly uh, shall we say, intensely negotiated and discussed. And uh, all developing countries and developed countries bring their uh, key uh, issues uh, of concern to this discussion. And so equity will be part of the discussion, but its precise form, it would be quite inappropriate at this stage to speculate. So let me leave it at that. Uh, we just wanted to add in response to uh, the, the point by Dr. Kevin Anderson about uh, taking this message forward. We have uh, one additional means that we uh, have launched, which is called the Climate Equity Monitor. This is the first database of this kind from any uh, country in the uh, global south. It provides, uh, is there any chance we can get it up on the uh, screen? Machine, so I can do it quick. Uh, the uh, uh, climate uh, equity monitor uh, that provides uh, data on global inequalities, uh, inter country inequalities in a number of uh, uh, variables. It does the carbon budget. It's about resource use, electricity consumption. Uh, it has analysis of the NDCs. So there is quite a bit that is available on this. So we just recently revamped it. Must congratulate uh, uh, all my uh, colleagues uh, who helped. Uh, Dr. Kanitkar and me put this together. Uh, so we invite everybody to take a look at this and uh, uh, we have put in something so that it is uh, the information is more popularly accessible, though uh, the detailed technical data is also available for download or if it is not ours, the appropriate links are provided. So you can see this. And uh, we, uh, at this stage, uh, uh, before uh, I should have done this earlier, my apologies, uh, we have uh, Mr. Akhil Maitri with us. He is with the third author on the presentation. He has busy, been busy operating the controls on the uh, webinar. Uh, we, are, uh, we are very grateful and... Uh, uh, he's a fine uh, pick as a graduate student. So people out there, uh, you know, if you don't pick him up, you're losing out. Okay, so that's uh, 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 colleague. We also are grateful 
uh, quite apart from the personal presence of the uh, uh, additional secretary today, we are also grateful for the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forests and Climate Change. Uh, we have worked uh, closely through the uh, with the scientific uh, division uh, of the uh, ministry and the uh, office of the scientific advisor, Dr. Butt. Uh, we are grateful for their support and encouragement and uh, a warm reception that they have always given to new scientific ideas. So this has been a good journey with them. Uh, the rest of the uh, the other officers of the ministry, the staff there, and uh, the secretary, additional secretary, uh, and also particularly to the personal interest and encouragement uh, shown by the uh, our respected minister, Mr. Bhupender Yadav. He has been uh, very encouraging of the role of scientists. He in fact, uh, kept an open channel for discussions from experts throughout COP26 and COP27. Uh, he has been very appreciative of scientific input and personally encouraging on some of his work. And uh, so we would like to place on record uh, their uh, encouragement. But the, as we say again, having said all this, the responsibility of this work is ours, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, if people have comments and uh, other uh, this thing, they are welcome to get in touch. We are available on social media. Links are available through the Climate Equity Monitor website to carry uh, forward any discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jairaman, and uh, thank you all of you for participating. I would request uh, Richa Sharmaji to have the final word. I just think she's there. Richaji? Richaji, are you there? <clears throat> no, I think she has left. Uh, scroll down. She was in her name only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or. There might have been some connectivity. No, she's okay. Okay. Would you like to say something, or we close? No, just, uh, uh, yeah. just a, um, a few words of thanks to add to uh, what Jeremy said. I think uh, there has been a tremendous support uh, for this work from. Uh, both our institutions, uh, uh, NIAS and MSSRF, uh, as well as from the ministry. And I think uh, it is very important uh, for work like this to have this kind of institutional support. So uh, just to sort of end with a, yeah. uh, with a thank and you. The, the recording. Will and be... uh, yes, we will. We have recorded the, uh, the session and uh, we will share the recording very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody for joining us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.